Good afternoon, my lord. You can start. Thank you very much. Now, the first Institute Party, Professor Michael Wainaina Moura, was an independent candidate. Between these two competing electoral outcome uh, contestants, he has come in as an independent candidate. But as the second petition has always said, Petering Katikati, he's not intending to do that. His intention is to demonstrate beyond peradventure that this was an election conducted within the prescription of the law. And therefore, his evidence, together with that of his IT expert, George Njeroge, will demonstrate that indeed this petition has not this petition has nothing to stand upon. My lords, the question is, where is the smoking gun? These petitioners allege there was a hacking of the IEBC systems. Where is the evidence? By whom? When? At what point? There is no evidence. These petitioners allege and claim that there was a voter intimidation. When, who, and what incident constituted that voter intimidation such as would overturn this election? My lords, my ladies, no presidential candidate is omniscient. In recognition of that fact, the legislature has provided in section 30 of the Elections Act the appointment of agents by a presidential candidate. The arena for the contest is not really here. It is, in fact, at the polling station. I submit that these petitioners, even by their own chief agent, have failed to tender any evidence sufficient at that level to overturn this election. Absent those agents' own prescription of what they saw, what they witnessed, what they actually underwent on behalf of the petitioners, you cannot then claim or have anyone claim that the election was not credible, that it was not fair, or that it did not have a result that actually expressed the will of the people. I dare submit that the absence of agents for a candidate in terms of evidence before this court speaks volumes. If my lords and my ladies were to look at this petition, prayer number C, D, E, F, and possibly G and H, they all revolve around the role of agents at the polling station, not the outcome at this stage. My lords and my ladies, Regulation 57 of the Elections General Regulations prescribe, and I quote, every independent candidate shall at least 14 days, a fortnight, to the date of the election, submit to the commission, the IBC, <clears throat> the names of one national chief agent and 47 county chief agents. These are the eyes of the petitioner at the polling station. Therefore, these petitioners cannot be hard to ask you for instance, a recount, a scrutiny if they have not demonstrated to you that they exercise that power given to them by the legislature at that level. At that level. My lords, my ladies, where is a smoking gun? By these agents? Remarkably, in the entire depositions tendered by these petitions, the chief agent chose to be silent the chief agent of the petitioners did not swear an affidavit. Nothing. He said 
nothing. And yet, Regulation 57.1 places upon him the statutory obligation to be the chief agent. <clears throat> Did he abdicate that role before your lordships? My ladies, perhaps. But his absence in terms of the credibility of the evidence speaks volumes in terms of the best evidence principle. Where is all this going? My lords, my ladies, you have decided in many other decisions, and indeed our whole jurisprudence is based that if there is a procedure laid down for a litigant to follow, if a statutory prescription does provide the way to resolve an issue, you must first invoke it. You will see, my lords, an allegation is made in paragraph 25 of Raila Odinga's affidavit, for instance. His affidavit in support, he says that indeed it is our belief that the electronic system was in fact compromised by unauthorized third parties and data therein manipulated and subsequently unlawfully transmitted to the constituency and national telling centers. That's it. Who manipulated the system? It's not said. When was this done? It is not stated. However, more remarkably, and against the background of what I've just stated, the chief agent, the chief agent position located at the National Talent Center is a person who should have sworn an affidavit to explicate that and say that indeed there was a hacking. There was an intrusion into the IEB system. By what evidence? My lords, I wish to take you to the affidavit of George Njoroge, which we filed in support, which is found at page 21 to page 102 of the notice of motion we had filed on the 24th of August. It's a very crucial document. That document at page 88 has a statement by NASA, which was read by the first petitioner to the members of the public. And my Lord, at paragraph 47 of the supporting, uh, the affidavit in reply by Michael Wainaina, Michael Wainaina has said, these allegations that are filtering through this petition which election are they referring to? Because as an independent candidate, I witnessed these elections fairness and its adjudication. Now, against that background, we go to page 88 of this document. The NASA fraternity had, stayed, had said, ladies and gentlemen, this election was not always about me through all my travels across the country and so on and so forth. But in paragraph two, he says that he was doing what he was doing in terms of disclosing what allegedly had happened to the IBC. The last line, I do this out of an obligation to Kenyans and out of a deep conviction to highest values that ought to bind us. So there he was. And I will presently show why I'm bringing this about in terms of relevance to this petition. Because this petition is presented in such a way that it has an aura. It has this uh, surface uh, feeling of that it is a genuine petition, that it is a valid petition. It bears with it the thrust and the force of the law and the evidence. But for five hours, my ladies and my uh, 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 lords, five hours, the dearth of that evidence was lacking. And so you are told that indeed there was a petition, there is a petition. So just like in that statement, there was allegedly a statement being made on behalf of the Kenyan people. Page 89. Page 89, paragraph 5 of that statement, made by the first petitioner, he said, while Kenyans were bearing the long queues to determine their destiny, the conspirators began the execution of their plan. At about 12.37 p.m. on the 8th of August, 2017, hackers gained entry into our election database through the identity of Chris Musando, 
who was executed barely a week ago into the account of the Mr. Chabukati chairperson. And he said that this is highlighted at page 52 of the document next to this statement. My lords, my ladies, as sensational as that statement was, as injurious as it could be to the IEBC's standing both locally and internationally, there is no reference in the entire affidavit of this petitioner of that incident. Nothing. So he says at that time that there was hacking. But his petition now does not make reference to what he did. Now, George Njoroge, the deponent, has demonstrated that there was and could not be any such hacking. Remarkably, neither Raila Odinga himself nor his chief agent, Musali Mudavadi, or anybody else has filed a rebuttal. Meaning, my lords, there is no weight that can be attached to the deposition that Raila Odinga has made, and I quoted in paragraph 25 of his affidavit. Going back, my lords and my ladies, to the issue of agents. Where is the evidence that the IEB system was hacked in terms of what my good professor Piero had called Pythagoras theorem? Where is the evidence? Now, accosted by that lack of evidence, staring at the petitioners, they have now told you, revise down your Raila 2013 threshold of the admission of evidence. That is a justification, my lords and my ladies. The only reason they are asking you to go back to the 2013 decision that you made is because they have no evidence. So they're asking you, lower for us the threshold to clamber over. And they have not shown or explained to you why did they come when, as my life friend Amenasir was submitting. During the Joho case, Nathif Jam case, or indeed, Ferdinand Waititi versus Kidero case, or Munya's case earlier on. All those, my lords, were opportunities. And my client is saying, it is just about time that we had respect for the rule of law. You read the petition. Other than paragraph 30, other than paragraph 30, my lords, there is no evidence that can support the allegation that this was not a credible or a fair election. But what does paragraph 30 of the petition relate to? The right to information. The invocation of Article 35, sub-Article 2 of the Constitution. The rest of the petition, running from paragraph 16 all the way to the end, relates to what agents should have done for these petitioners at the polling stations. Allow me with your kind permission to buttress my submission by reference to the regulations explicating this. The elections general regulations in regulation 86 and their subheaded a recount, which as we would in the interpretation in General Provisions Act does not count in terms of the reference. However, it states and I, allow me with your very kind permission. A candidate or agent, if present when the counting is completed, may require the presiding office to have the votes rechecked. My lords, my ladies, I invite you to have reference to that provision because you have been told the, the issue of, for instance, spoiled votes or rejected votes. There is a lamentation from the petitioners. There seems to be a high incidence of this rejected voice. Is that your province? At the first instance, is that your province? It can't be, surely. And this petition has state in paragraph 13 of their own petition. Laws and regulations surely must have a force. <coughs> they must have a meaning. 
So these candidates, origins, should have that right to have the votes rechecked and recounted. Or the presiding officer may on his own or her own initiative have the votes recounted. And I quote, sub-regulation two. No step shall be taken on the completion of a count or recount of votes until the candidates or agents present at the completion of the counting have been given a reasonable opportunity to exercise the right given to this regulation. My lords, my ladies, is there a single form 34A? These petitioners can demonstrate to you that that right was denied them. None from their entire thrust of submissions. What is the net effect of all this? I invite you, my lords, as you did hold in 2013, to hold in paragraph 304, 305, and 306 of that decision. You ask in paragraph 304 a rhetorical question. I quote with your kind permission. Did the petitioners, Raila Odinga, Clearly and decisively, those are your words, show the conduct of the election to have been so devoid of merits and so distorted as not to reflect the expression of the people's electoral intent? That was your rhetorical question in 2013. And I would submit it echoes so many years down the line. And you say it is this broad test that should guide us in this kind of case in deciding whether we should disturb the outcome of the presidential election. And you say it in paragraph 305. Firstly, we have considered the extent to which any breach of the law would have been occasioned in the several areas of operation and whether such would disclose reprehensible conduct having the effect of negating the voters' intent. And lastly, you make your decision, I quote the second last, actually the last line and that paragraph 306, it would be the magnum opus, opus if I would say, of your finding. It is not evident on the facts of this case that the candidate declared as the president-elect had not obtained the basic vote threshold justifying his declared as such. I was 2013, it is now 2017. I close my thoughts by citing the submissions which I had submitted and filed on the 25th. My lords, there is <clears throat> a decision from Canada, I don't have time to recite all of it, at page two of my uh, submissions. <clears throat> Dorothy E. Brontown versus John uh, Hart, Kangas and others. It was a Queen's Bench Division in Manitoba. Paragraph seven of my submissions. When interpreting legislation relating to elections, one may reasonably conclude the primary purpose is to ensure that we have a free, open, and properly conducted democratic elections. And I have underscored this. If there have been irregularities, these should be exposed to the view of the general public through the returning officer. And the crux is here unfortunately for the petitioners, and through the candidates and their agents involved in the recounts. Would we depart from that position? I doubt. My last statement, my lords, every candidate, including the presidential candidates here before you, did sign the electoral code of conduct. Allegations were made that the third respondent violated the electoral code of conduct. I beg to differ. If there was a violation, was the Elections Act in, Offenses Act invoked, invoked? No evidence. Was the IABC Enforcement of Electoral Code of Conduct Committee invoked in terms of Regulation 15.1? No evidence. And therefore, my last remark is this, that in Regulation 6.0, which is found at page 4, it states, and I quote, Paragraph 21, without prejudice to the right to present a petition to an election court, and I have underscored this, every candidate should, shall accept the final outcome of the election and the commission's declaration and certification of the results thereof. That's what the first petitioner signed to. 
he ought to abide by it. I rest my laws and my ladies that you dismiss this petition with cause unless you have questions.